Are we live? All right. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Doug Mutart. Um, I'm the chief architect for the big data infrastructure and engineering organization at General Motors. Um, you probably figured this out by now, but GM is headquartered right here in Detroit, Michigan, um, at the Rensen, just a, a block over. Uh, I work with 155,000 other people that have the same passion that I do for design, engineering, technology, um, and we have this shared vision of zero crashes, zero emissions, and zero congestion. Uh, my contribution to that is really working on our connected electric and autonomous vehicle programs um, to really give them the enabling technology to see this vision come to life. Uh, it's actually, there's some significance um, having the conference here today. Um, it was, I was sitting in this building 22 years ago, almost to the day um, when Scott McNeely said something that really would set the stage for a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, back, back in those days, um, we talked a lot about Genie technology, Corba, Java spaces. Um, you know, today we're gonna talk about actor systems and reactive streams. Um, the thing that still amazes me is that we're still talking about Java on wheels. I mean, essentially, right? So, um, you know, I, I just thought that it was a really interesting tidbit that, you know, at Converge, Convergence 2000, we were having this discussion, you know, um, about Java on wheels. Um, everywhere I work at GM now, I'm finding applications uh, for reactive systems, you know, that are responsive, resilient, elastic, message-driven. Um, every team I talk to is using event-driven architectures. Um, you know, we're seeing, we're using high-speed vehicle telemetry to build customer, dealer, uh, partner experiences. Um, we're using industrial IoT in the assembly and manufacturing plants to do device-level analytics, um, look at, you know, how do we prevent, you know, machinery from breaking down. Um, we're building digital twins to configure um, command, control, uh, the vehicles themselves. Um, you know, they've got, you know, tons of, of different electronics in there that we can manage um, through a digital twin. We're building fast data pipelines for that vehicle to be able to interact, you know, with, with its environment, you know, something like the smart grid. And, uh, and we're even using it to really entertain, you know, motorsports enthusiasts, uh, really build that brand loyalty, um, you know, around our products, and, and, and you know, we do that in motorsports as well. Um, so, f just to kind of give you a little bit of my definition of what an actor is, right? An actor, to me, it's this fundamental primitive of you know concurrent computing. Um, actors receive messages. They, they react to those messages, they might update their internal state, uh, they might log you know, those messages to some sort of uh, you know, event store, uh, they'll probably spawn other actors, um, they, they might send additional messages downstream to other actors. Uh, with that sort of primitive in mind, you can see where you know, the actor's purpose is to process messages. And so if you're building an event-driven architecture that needs to be low latency, fault tolerant, um, and done at scale, um, an actor system is re a really good starting point um, for, for what you're building. Um, they're, you know, they're also, at, you know, working with actors is great for developers as well. Um, you know, I know when I used to do development, you know, I didn't want to have to worry about, you know, all of the air logic, you know, thread safety, you know, half the errors I got, you know, when I went to compile my code was around, you know, not casting things to the right type. Um, so, you know, those are other huge advantages uh, of working with the actor model. Um, and as an architect, you know, when you're working across business domains, uh, this, act, you know, 
an actor system provides a really great bounded context that you can use to reason about with other people, talk to other people. And so it's kind of this natural um, way to, to talk about these, you know, what, what could be very complex systems. An automobile, I mean, is really just a huge, complex mechatronic system. We've got actuators, sensors, we've got uh, MCUs, microcontroller units all over the vehicle. Um, they're all passing signals to one another um, over different communication buses. We have a low speed bus, a high speed bus. Um, and it's really helpful if you start modeling, you know, the software systems you're building, you know, around that domain. It, it becomes this natural way to kind of create a digital twin of the, the thing that you have in the real world. Um, it's, it makes for a very intuitive API. If you want to do a door unlock, you know, talk to the door actor, right? If you, if you want to, you know, start the ignition, you know, talk to the propulsion actor. So we've got this kind of natural fit of an actor model to the thing we're building, this mechatronic system in the real world. Um, it's also super handy, you know, to have this as a digital twin in the back office that really kind of provides that shadow state of what might be running in the embedded system. So you can have a copy, and if you get really ambitious, you can have a copy of the same code, you know, that you're running on the vehicle, running in the back office. And that enables all kinds of opportunities to do emulation, simulation, um, you know, you can, you can practice doing a firmware update, you know, Colin mentioned, you know, some of those use cases you see. Um, so it's really just, to me, the biggest advantage of working with the actor model in, in automotive is this, this notion of a domain-driven design that everyone can latch onto, engineers, software developers, business folks. Um, you know, Jonas actually mentioned it too, you know, you're climbing that abstraction ladder, right? You know, the, the better your abstraction of your problem domain, uh, you know, the easier it is to work with these problems. So, you know, th this notion though of like an actor that manages the behavior and state um, for itself uh, is really powerful. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar, um, if you work with the Aka Toolkit, there's a sample application that everybody looks at called the Dining Hackers, you know, application. And it's really just a, an example of a finite state machine, you know, built with actors that kind of message one another and change their state. And so if, if you start looking at something a little bit more complex, like a, a mechatronic system, like a, like a vehicle, um, you can build, you know, a state model as well, right? And it can be arbitrarily complex. Um, you know, what happens when your, your charging is interrupted for your EV, right? What happens when you're, you've got super crews going, you're level two autonomous going down the highway, and somehow that disengages, right? So you can, you can build these state machines, basically, that handle, you know, all these different events. Um, and, and you really start to build you're starting to define almost the day in the life of a drive or a driver, if you want to think of it that way. Um, but, but, you know, what happens really when instead of just one drive, you start thinking about, you know, a, a trip, you know, in, in, instead of just one trip, you know, maybe, maybe a journey, you know, instead of one journey, tens, hundreds, thousands of journeys, you really start to build, um, you know, th this day in the life, right, of, of a driver that you start to understand um, that's way more important than just sort of the software that you wrote. Um, now, what, what happens if you start infusing that state model that you've built with intelligence from other sources? Um, it turns out there's, there's some prior art on this. Um, the, military intelligence analysis community had this notion of something called activity-based intelligence, right? And so what they're looking at is, you know, these diverse data sources, you know, data streams, if you want to think of them that way, coming in and, and they're trying to look for patterns or more importantly, they're trying to look for pattern, changes to patterns. 
And they use that to really create decision advantage for their warfighters. And we said, well, hey, you know, wonder if we did the same thing to create value for our customers, right? So we started to look at, you know, all of these data streams coming in, um, you know, as a way to look at patterns of life. Um, you've got, you know, geo intelligence. You know, we've got the latitude, longitude, speed, direction of the vehicles. You know, we can draw polygons. You know, to do, um, you know, to, to paint various uh, um, geofences. You know, around points of interest. Uh, we've got human intelligence, right? We know driver preferences. We know passenger preferences, their settings. We've got human intelligence. Uh, no, I just mentioned that. Um, signal intelligence, measurement stuff. You know, we know weather, road conditions. You know, our lidar can even pick up. You know, is is there a pothole? You know, in, in this section of the roadway. Um, we use open source intelligence, right? You can do social media mining. Uh, you can look at government government data sets, or we've got our own. You know, fleet of vehicles doing millions of drives every day. We can use that data that we capture. Um, and then we, you know, we've got the signal intelligence, right? The, the actual vehicle telemetry coming in from the hundreds of sensors that we have on the car. Um, you know, and all these sources really can be, you can use reactive streams to kind of broadcast them, aggregate and filter these events coming in. You can train AI models, you can survey AI models that make predictions and inferences about this data. And then you kind of merge the streams back together and, uh, for action, right? So this is sort of that notion of using, you know, an actor as sort of an autonomous agent who's looking at these patterns, making decisions, and then taking action. So it's very powerful when you start to think about um, using an actor system in this context to enable activity-based intelligence. Um, so one of the things that I, I think I've heard a couple times at the conference today already is, you know, what's the developer experience like when you're building these kinds of systems, right? So it's really important. I mean, you have to pick, you know, you've got that whole menu of choices to make, right? We, we use the ACA toolkit quite extensively. Um, but, what, but there's so many different features and capabilities you know, we've taken a product management approach where we start to build um, what we call a product, you know, out of that toolkit that we can then deliver to our data science community, our developer community. Uh, some folks want an SDK. So we'll take specific features, capabilities, and we'll give them a, an SDK that, that makes it consistent, uh, you know, conformant to what we want and they can use that SDK to build the, these actor systems and streams. Um, but some folks, you know, maybe uh, an engineer um, that's doing some analysis of, of one of our electrical control units, uh, he just wants the data, right? He's like, hey, just, you know, just give me the, the raw protobuf coming off the vehicle bus, you know, wrap it in a cloud event so I know, the, you know, what the metadata looks like. Uh, so for them, we just give them a simplified API. Um, and we've you know gotten pretty creative with the tools that are already available, right? We can we can use something like similar to Spring Initializer, where we can just basically generate you know an actor system that they can use. They can use configuration files to say, hey, I want you know this Kafka topic, this Pulsar topic to be streamed to this Azure Event Hub's topic, and I want to transform it you know from Avro to JSON. And if we don't have that maybe they can build their own plugin that does that transformation, right? So that's this notion of um, really just tailoring the whole developer experience around the preferred programming paradigm of the people that are using the, these systems. Um, th then you've got your runtime model, right? So we've, we've talked a little bit about this in, in other talks today. Um, we use the ACA toolkit, which runs on the JVM. Uh, that's very versatile. You know, we, we're able to apply that on embedded systems. We can do it with virtualized systems. Works really well in containerized environments. Uh, we often run it in Kubernetes. Um, 
these, these all actually really help because they provide these additional layers of elasticity and resiliency that you want in a system like this. I would say one of our challenges and one of the shortcomings right now is um, there just hasn't been enough work done on running you know, JVMs in safety critical environments. Colin mentioned um, safety critical systems a little bit. Um, micro containers, micro VMs like Firecracker and Kata. Just, there's just not a, enough work going on really on, on what the what the next you know, generation of this runtime model really needs to look like. Um, but once you've got a runtime model to work with, and, and this works perfectly well, um, you gotta figure out, well, how, you know, how are you deploying this, right? And so we're seeing you know, already just a, a, a wide array of different places that we can deploy these actor systems and these reactive streams. Um, we run it in our own private cloud that, that, that we've built um, usually on Kubernetes, sometimes on virtual machines. Uh, we run it in Azure Cloud. Uh, for some of our use cases, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about motorsports and, and NASCAR. Um, you may wanna run it on hyper-converged infrastructure, right? It, you might wanna run it on a, you know, in the pit box, you know, at track side. Uh, you might wanna run it um, on sort of AT&T's compute in a 5G you know, network node. Um, so you've really got this whole sort of different uh, spectrum of deployment models to work with. Um, some of the things though that, that are, you know, solvable really are, you've got to, you've got to really under, start understanding like geolocation based routing and DNS. Um, what you build needs to work really well with the service discovery models that are in place. You, you need to be able to locate sort of the actor system that you're trying to talk to. Um, and I, I would say one of the challenges still is this control plane. And, and Colin talked about that a little bit too. Um, maybe web, WebAssembly is part of the answer, right? But um, you wanna have the same pipeline basically that's able to deploy these actor systems you know, into these different deployment models. And then when you get into these different deployment models, right, things become distributed very quickly. You've got things running embedded, you've got things running on the edge, you've got actor systems and streams running in the cloud. You really need to start working out, hey, you know, where can I back pressure? Where can I not back pressure? Um, where, where can I buffer? Um, if you're doing 10 million messages per second, you're not gonna be able to buffer for very long, right? So, um, and every hop, sort of as you go through these different network topologies, some of the hops are fast, you know, very low latency, you know, sub milliseconds even in some cases, and some are very slow. You know, maybe going from cloud to data center is 25 millisecond latency, right? So you've really gotta start working this out for yourself and figure out, okay, where, where can I buffer, where can I back pressure, and where can I put brokers, right? So, you know, we, we've, um, there was a presentation earlier today on NATs, you know, that was, you know, certainly something you could consider. Um, you know, we use Pulsar and Kafka for some of the, for the brokers between, say, data center and cloud. Um, you might use Azure Event Hubs if you're running in, in Azure Cloud. Um, but you really do need to figure out, okay, what's the role of a broker? Um, and, and in some cases, you know, we've been forced to kind of go brokerless, right? As, as the message volumes increase, um, you know, you start to see, you know, a lot of IO problems, um, even, even with brokers like Pulsar. And, uh, and so you need to start thinking about, hey, may, maybe we switch to a protocol like gRPC and, and we go brokerless. Um, so one, once you start to distribute your actor systems like this and distribute your streams, it's, hard, it's a whole different ball game. Um, so speaking of ball games, so having done a lot of this in the connected vehicle space, the electric vehicle space, um, got a phone call, you know, probably a little over a year ago saying, hey Mutart, can you and the team come down to Charlotte, North Carolina and do money ball for motorsports, right? And, uh, you know, motorsports is a big money business. Um, 
a NASCAR Cup Series sponsor might pay tens of millions of dollars to have their logo uh, to sponsor a car for, for a 38 race season. Um, companies like GM, it's really important because it builds brand loyalty, right? If we win the NASCAR Cup Series, you know, if it's a Chevrolet that wins, um, that means a lot to, to our, our enthusiasts. Um, so we were asked to kind of go and say, hey, how can we apply this notion of actor systems, reactive streams, activity-based intelligence um, to help our, our Chevy racing teams become more competitive. Um, and it really, I mean, it requires that millisecond mindset, right? I mean, we're talking, you know, a, a, a processing stage of one of these streams might be tens of microseconds, right? And, and so, um, you know, we found that, you know, this is super helpful um, because we have, again, we've got such a diversity of different kinds of data coming in. You know, we've got people all around the track taking photographs. We've got spotters. We've got live video of every pit stop. All that needs to be processed in real time, right? We need to do um, text analytics um, on all of the different radio communications between the driver and the pit crew and the spotters and, and what, what the NASCAR race you know, officials are, are talking about on the radio. Um, the race strategy, we, we have to use AI to really augment um, the decisions made by the driver and the crew chief um, in real time, right? We have to make decisions like, you know, do we pit or do we not pit now? Do we take two tires? Do we take four tires? Do we top off our fuel? Do we make any adjust, you know, adjustments to the chassis? And, um, you know, we're looking at, you know, when a car gets hit, you know, what's, what's the size of the, uh, of the damage, you know, on, on the quarter panel? Um, and we have to use photogrammetry to do that. So we, we found that using reactive streams, we could actually just process an immense amount of this data in real time, serve up AI models, make decisions, um, and really just generate that competitive advantage. And, you know, you can, you can understand some of the challenges here. You, you know, you've got 40 cars racing around the track at almost 200 miles an hour. You're trying to do like a Haversine distance calculation between all 40 cars to see how close, you know, they are to one another. You're trying to make decisions in real time based on, you know, the traffic density, you know, how much dirty air is there. Um, you know, because drag and all that really matters. I mean, just an example would be, a 1% reduction in drag, like at a, a track like Daytona, you know, could be 10 positions at the end of the race for you. So it's really um, a really cool place to start to apply some of this reactive stream, um, reactive system uh, architecture to a, a very interesting problem domain. Um, you know, and obviously, the digital twin also comes into play, right? You, you've, you've only got 40 cars, right? So you can pretty much, you know, have a, you know, ghost car, you know, a digital twin of every vehicle running for the entire race. And you can go back three years and replay these races as many times as you want to do training and simulation. So it's a um, it's really powerful application of this. Um, so, Jonas had a quote very similar to this er earlier um, in, in the opening keynote. Um, this one kind of is a little older than that, but, but Boss Kettering was um, really the wizard of General Motors, right? He's the one that invented the electric starter and you know, 175 other different things in the automotive business. And, and you know, but again, the concept was, you know, and this is really what, what I'm getting at with today, today's talk. Um, we really need to start rethinking, you know, what about the primitives that we're using to construct these systems, right? This, this isn't, um, and, and what I mean by that, you know, is, you know, first we have to kind of figure out what's this pattern that, that's reoccurring like over and over and over again, right? And every example that I've given today really is, hey, you're processing an unbounded stream of events, right? It's nice to have functional operators, merge, broadcast, you know, concatenate. Um, they have to interact with this actor system, this digital twin that you've built that really encapsulates all the behavior of, of the system. 
um, you may want to write all those events out to a log, a journal of some sort, right, so that you can replay them later, so that you can recover from failures faster. Um, you know, and then you typically put the results of uh, those decisions out in some sort of messaging system, right? It could be a, a, a grid or service mesh of some sort. It might be a message broker like Pulsar or Kafka. But this is sort of the pattern that kind of comes up over and over again, right? And um, it's very easy to insert AI and machine learning like into this sort of virtuous cycle. I purposely drew the arrow that way to make it look a little bit like a smile. Um, but but because every time I see a new problem, um, I immediately kind of think about this pattern and how we can apply it. Um, but the real shift in thinking, right, is, is to stop thinking about, you know, all these different, you know, web service frameworks and, you know, different logging frameworks and figuring out service registries and containers and container orchestration. I mean, at this point, data is an afterthought, right? It, it becomes an accident of the architecture. You know, the last thing on the list uh, is, is sort of your data. And, and what we found is we're really starting to take this data-centric you know, view of the world, right? Where everything's an actor, an event, a stream, a function. Um, we may or may not you know, log those events you know, somewhere to an event store. Um, but th those really become the primitives that you start working with. And, and that, that's been a real game changer for us. Um, you know, but where, where it goes from here, right? We, we've um, seen a little, I mean, serverless definitely you get that with the cloud. Um, it's a little harder to do in your own data center, but um, you know that's kind of evolved into this notion of database, database list, right? Where you, you know, yeah, you may have an event store where you're putting stuff, but you as a programmer don't worry about it, right? You let the infrastructure take care of that. Um, you know, we're starting to think really heavily about how do we go brokerless, right? A broker is a bottleneck at the end of the day, right? It, it's it's going to be you know, IO that might become a bottleneck. Um, but where we really want to get to, right, is data scientists, developers, they're scarce resources. Um, you know, if you can build the developer experience and, you know, maybe even get beyond the developer experience to a point where it's de developerless, I guess is, the, is what I called it here, um, you know, then you're really talking something different. And, and I guess the way I see that, like if I, if I was a futurist, right, is, that you've got these actors who are kind of coming up with their own new behaviors, you know, on the fly. Um, they're always learning, they're always adapting. It's almost like a neural network uh, of actors. Um, and, and, you know, this is really letting machines do the work, right? And, and that's really where ultimately we have to go. A lot of the systems I showed you, you know, it takes teams of architects and developers and testers to get those systems right. Um, you know, I'd really like to get to a point where, you know, these, these primitives, you know, the, these compute primitives that we have um, are able to do that for themselves, right? And just take advantage of the infrastructure that we give them. So, um, so that's really, you know, basically the big, big uh, takeaway for, for me is, is, you know, kind of switching your mindset, you know, pivot from, this sort of code-centric view to the world to this data-centric uh, set of primi primitives. Um, and then hopefully we'll get to you know, that, that point where it's just kind of doing its own thing. Thanks. Akada AI, I kind of like that. Um, you know, and, and there's some, like I said, there, there is some prior art on, on some of that, right? Like Netflix has tried to like integrate, um, you know, AI into like reactive streams. You know, there's libraries out there like, you know, um, Deep Java library, right? That lets you take like TensorFlow models or really anything from like a model zoo, have a plugin, you know, sort of AI. 
and it, it, it do, you know, it's not a big leap to just say, okay, I've got an actor that serves a model, and um, I think the harder thing, and I've been actually talking to some of our R&D people about is, um, you know, how do you do the learning that way too, right? Because if it can be self-taught, um, you know, and, you know, you can serve the model, that, that's even better, right? But, but it, you know, the actor model is a great fit for AI, really, um, you know, so. Yeah, 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 so. Any other questions? Awesome, but it's been great to see, though, all the speakers today kind of hitting some of the same points, right? Maybe from different angles, but I think we're all seeing sort of the same um, trends starting to emerge and, and some of the same challenges that need to still need to be overcome.